we are controlling transmission. If we wish to make it louder, we will bring up the volume. If we wish to make it softer, we will tune it to a whisper. Sit quietly and we will control all that you hear. We repeat, there is nothing wrong. You are about to participate in a great adventure. We interrupt this program with a special bulletin. America is now under martial law. All constitutional rights have been suspended. Remain calm. Do not panic. The comfort you've demanded is now mandatory. National security is more important than individual will. It is Monday night, and you're listening to Liberty Unfiltered. For those regular listeners, yes, this is not the normal day that I am on. Uh, It will be from now on. I am now on Mondays. I am back on K98 (laughs) Talk. Uh, You can join me here tonight in the chat room just by going to k98talk.com forward slash chat hyphen room. Uh, So join us in here, and uh, we're going to have a lot of fun tonight. Uh, tonight, my guest is uh, Jeffrey Tucker. Uh, he has been with us before. I want to uh, welcome him back. Uh, tonight, we're going to be talking about practical anarchy. We're going to learn some ways that you can apply anarchy into your daily life. Um, a lot of people seem to think that anarchy is this concept that's all about chaos and and no... Uh, just chaotic, willy-nilly, everybody just out doing crazy things. But but in fact, anarchy is simply just a matter of uh, not anything, you know, something that isn't directed by the state. You can find anarchy in practically everything around us. Uh, in fact, according to my guest, he says that anarchy is all around us. Uh, including in our churches, our friendships, and especially the internet. So, let me welcome to the show once again, uh, Mr. Jeffrey Tucker. Jeff, you there? Yes, I am. Thank you, Steve, for having me. Great. Thanks for coming on again. Sure. Um, so, you some of the things you've written contend that people can live in peaceful cooperation without state control. Yeah, and so you know, what we're going to talk about today is just to uh, give people some ideas of how, number one, anarchy is already all around them, and number two, how they can apply it to their own lives. Well, I think in many ways we already do apply it in our own lives. I mean, most of our interactions day to day exist on completely voluntary cooperation. You know, the police aren't surrounding us all the time telling us, you know, what to eat, when to get up, uh, you know, what kind of soap to use in the shower, you know, whether to shower, uh, what job to take, who we're going to fall in love with, you know, how we're going to spend our money. I mean, this is the, the fact is that uh, for the most part, and, and even under Leviathan conditions that we have today, the state is absence, absent in most of our lives, and that's for a reason. It's because most people don't like it and don't need it. So, you know, I mean, if I'm always amazed at the people who say that anarchy wouldn't work. Um, because if they, once they reflect on their own, their own lives and their own doings, and, you know, their subdivisions, their apartment units, the places they eat, the grocery stores they go to, they'd realize that human volition is the thing that makes society work at all. And um, it's not the state. The state does not make this happen. It's, 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 it's anarchy itself that works. <clears throat> and just a brief reflection on your own life will show that. So uh, it's always funny to me that people talk about anarchy as, as leading to chaos. As a matter of fact, 
the absence of the state encourages solutions and human associations. The presence of the state does exactly the opposite. It divides people and it causes enormous problems that led, leads to you know, all, all sorts of you know, poverty and um, every kind of human suffering. Um, and, and this is just the practical reality. Most people who imagine there has to be a state are always in their own minds thinking of a state that they don't know, that really doesn't exist. You know, some ideal type that they, they think should exist but doesn't exist. And yet it comes right down to it, they end up sort of, sort of endorsing the thing they hate. I'm always intrigued by people who are not anarchists because as much as they hate the you know, present status quo, there's a weird sense in which they fear anarchy even more. And I, I kind of would I'd like to see people get over that and realize that actually anarchy is the source of all the beauty in our lives. Yeah, it's, it's kind of funny how some people have this perception of anarchy um, just based off of I guess previous uh, perception of it um, through, uh, I guess, through music and through uh, film, uh, without actually digging into, like I said, the idea that it's already here in a lot of ways, especially with uh, technology. Um, well, that's certainly true. I mean, the internet is, a, is a, a, an amazing case because I mean, essentially, it was privatized and. In 1995, you know, with the with the with the web browser uh, invented and radio waves, um, you know, auctioned off, and the government sort of bailed from all of its interest it had in the in, in the internet, apart from a little slice of real estate. And over the last 20 years, we've seen, you know, life completely transformed uh, for billions of people. Uh, you know, it's connected us as never before, and we've we've created whole worlds. Uh, without any government direction at all. I mean, the only role in the government's had in the internet has been to annoy, you know, companies like like Microsoft, you know, or 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 um, uh, you know, badger Google into getting a pipeline, you know, the NSA surveillance or something like that. But essentially, the government's done nothing productive or wonderful. It didn't do anything to bring about the app economy that we all uh, live off. You know, every single day. I mean, this is the way we get along, and the way we associate, and the way we conduct our lives now. It's all a prog a, prog a, a, um, a result of this sort of spontaneous interaction of people. So, anarchy really is working. I have to tell you that I, I read an article today by one of my favorite thinkers and writers, Ayn Rand. It was written in 1964, and it was um, a kind of a really vigorous and strong case against. Anarchism, and you know, I take her very seriously, and I'm glad to, you know, if you want to talk about what that article is about and, and some of what's wrong with it. Um, but I, you know, I, I reflected on it very deeply today. You know, just reading through it and thinking about her fears. Um, ultimately, I, it's it's very strange. It's um, there's a sense in which, even though she was a very strong believer in freedom, she ultimately believed that that freedom fails at some fundamental level. Um, and I think she's just just wrong about that. So she's not necessarily the uh, anarchist idealist that everybody seems to think she is. No, no. I mean, she she believed in a in a very limited state. But it's very strange when you read her article because yeah. the state she believes in is not one that exists. It's one that she sort of imagined in her mind. But uh, but the the existing state she she regards as being. A looter and a parasite, and something that's causing disorder and and problems in, in society, and she freely admits this and argues this very passionately. But she still holds out the possibility that there could be some sort of ideal state that would just sort of um, protect property rights and keep the yeah. keep keep the law and be an expression of objective values and that kind of thing. It's, well, it's, when in it's fact very, we we see the state doing the exact opposite more and more every day. They're taking away property rights. They're taking away personal liberties. Yeah. Um, yeah, she admits that, uh, but she she really does imagine that. I I mean, she doesn't actually say this in the article, but I was actually thinking about this. It's like, do, do, does Rand think that as bad as the present situation is, that that anarchy would even be worse? And I I think she does actually. I mean, it's for that whole kind of generation of classical liberal intellectuals, and I include my 
my own uh, mentor, you know, Ludwig von Mises in this, and and of course it goes all the way back, you know. Yeah. Um, they they all and this includes Hazlitt and Bastiat and and so many great great uh, thinkers. Um, but in the end, they were sort of Hobbesians. They had this this uh, perception that um, that that if we unplug the state, that that some uh, some terrible nightmare you know would come about that humanity wouldn't know how to solve. It, it's a very interesting thing that people who imagine there has to be a state, yes. of course they they know that it has to be constructed out of something, right? I mean, you have to use the existing firmament of society to construct this thing that they call the state. Um, but they don't imagine that that same society that would construct the state is capable of solving their problems without the state. So it's a little bit of a paradox. Well, most people today don't seem to have the same concept of the state as you or I or, or others do. Um, they... They have become more and more distracted as uh, time goes by, and, and they're not even aware that their freedoms are eroding. Uh, for I mean, for instance, the uh, your book, A Beautiful Anarchy. There was a, there was a, a one of the themes in it. Uh, it was kind of draw to draw attention um, to this reality that we're in. <laughs> Uh, that most people don't even seem to notice. No, that's right. <coughs> I tend to see, see the state as nothing but a drag on our lives. <coughs> I mean, most of most of everything we experience is wonderful. You know, everything we experience is wonderful. It's an extension of anarchies. And, and if you look at the real way the state works in the world, all it does is sort of pillage us and stop us from doing what we otherwise would want to do. So what is it that we want to do? I mean, that's sort of an inter the, the fundamental question that all social thinkers, you know, ask. What is it that humanity aspires to achieve and what means are there available to achieve those things? And I would say that um, gradually over the course of historical evolution, we've, we've increasingly come to understand that what we want, what we want is peace and prosperity, you know? Um, and it's true that there's a widespread disagreement on exactly how to get there, but, uh, you know, to my evaluation, um, the things that are, that are standing most in the way of these ideals of peace and prosperity are our governments around the world. They're, they're, they are the number one impediment to, to the realization of, of the dreams that are widely held on the left and the right. It's just that people aren't entirely aware of that. Right. Um, but we have, we have so many tools that can be used uh, that are you know, not not directed by the state, or at least not yet, not controlled by the state. Uh, tools that we can use every day, and that we you do use every day, and don't even think about it. You know, uh, uh, smartphones. Um, um, it, you know, you, you there was an article that you wrote recently. Uh, I don't remember how recent it was, but it was making the world a freer place, uh, where you mentioned things like smartphones, crowdsourcing, uh, open source software. Uh, alternative currencies, homeschooling, uh, all of these things we use to get away uh, from this control. Um, and they work that better. That's what's ironic to me, is that these non-state, unapproved, permissionless innovations in the, in the app world and, and in homeschooling and, in, and so many other areas of life um, are actually functioning much better than, than, than governments. And you know, it's very interesting to me, and I think it's the absolutely thrilling thing about our time, that the times in which we live, that um, that we have real brilliant examples all around us of non-state alternatives to state programs, and we have private arbitration as compared to government courts. You know, we have Uber uh, relative to um, you know, municipal taxi monopolies. Right. We have. Right. Uh, private schooling compared to, to public schooling and so on. I mean, you know, we're increasingly in the position, thanks to entrepreneurship and innovation, to be able to compare the world that private enterprise is capable of cre 
creating to the world that that the government's creating, and 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 humanity is choosing uh, the private al- alternatives over the over the government plans. And well, all in a way, of life. in a way, we're kind of going full circle because all of this innov- innovation existed. Uh, no, I mean, not these specific innovations, but innovation in general existed before uh, government control. Um, one example I, I can bring up is is private charity. Private charity existed uh, long before government welfare came onto the scene. Uh, and it worked well for hundreds of years. <laughs> you know, it's so true. It's, it's one of the great uh, tragedies that that humanity <coughs> has no memory of this, but like like yeah. in the late nineteenth century, there was a vast philanthropic sector. I mean, it was um, just the number of orphanages in this country that were run by private charity, who um, you know created a big a business about what you would consider the size of, of Microsoft t- today. Yeah, uh, it was it was a huge enterprise, not in the sense that it was for profit, but in the sense that it employed a ton of people, it was a gigantic uh, priority for philanthropists and private individuals and, and really everybody. Um, and uh, uh, it, was all, it was all kind of shut down in the progressive era with a, a sort of a, a gradual nationalization well, yeah, when, of charity. Uh, and and you know and a pillaging of of the large fortunes. Of well, well, right. That you know the state uh, assumed control over this. Uh, That's right. Um, you know over this uh, endeavor, and and to this day it still uses its its force uh, to exercise that control. Yeah, and 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 it was a crowding out that took place, and so this is one of the great tragedies of of life under under the state is we, we are not fully aware of the costs that we've paid for constructing these this gigantic Leviathan all around us. It, the the costs are really largely invisible to us because they consist of things that are that were that were that were displaced long before we were born or um, were never invented because the state monopolized things. And that that's what's really striking about our times is that we're actually seeing how um, uh, private enterprise is making an in run around around uh, the government, and and this kind of progress is taking place every day. I mean, you only need to reflect on the fact that, like you know, twenty years ago, the only way to get a message from me to you would have been to um, call on a government-owned phone or or uh, send a letter, you know, uh, delivered through uh, with a, a government employee. We're carrying around sacks on his back, you know. Yeah. And yeah. Na- now, uh, you know, there's so many ways for us to communicate. It's getting ridiculous. I mean, you know, every day I'm juggling SMS and and Snapchat and, and Facebook messaging and uh, uh, texts to my Skype accounts, and <laughs> you know, it's you know, it's just it's just unthinkable. You know, not to mention you know, emails and mes- messaging through Liberty Me, and you know, I mean, it's just. Yeah, uh, you know, even ten years ago, who would have who would have thought that it, it, social media would have grown this big? Yeah, and we we have a desperate desire to connect with each other. I mean, that's what yes. that's what social media really illustrates. I mean, mm-hmm. it, it's interesting. I, I feel I feel like to some extent, what what private enterprises are in our time is revealing to us is all the ways in which humanity is sort of desperate to cooperate with each other, you know? Yeah. And yet we've heard for generations that we need a government to, <laughs> uh, to, to, you know, to, get, to get us cooperate with each other. You know... Oh, because the government's so good at cooperating with people. Yeah. <laughs> well, again, let me just want to give one quick example because I'm, 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 I'm just very, I'm very interested in this, in this Rand article, but not to pick on this, this brilliant woman, but... Um, so she's writing this article in like April of 1964, and 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 it's, it's funny. She she gives two examples. And, um, the first one she gives is that uh, you you have to have a monopoly on on government, or else uh, people will just fight. Like for example, if if Jim subscribes to government A, or you know a set of laws A, and and John subscribes to a set of laws B, 
and there's a conflict between the two individuals and representatives of each individual legal system show up at each other's doors and neither recognizes the authority of other of the other uh, what 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 are they going to do and she stops her narrative right there and she says um, I'll let you fill in the rest okay so that's it's a um, that that's a funny comment because um, uh, I, I think you know she assumes she presumes that the answer is that they will fight until the death but the actual reality is that um, and most likely they would try to figure out some way to, to resolve their differences peacefully <laughs> that's, that's, the, that's, that's the world that I think is emerging and, and the one that I think we know and, and she's just, she was just wrong about that yeah I have to agree I think, I think more people I mean there's, there's your um, scattered few who are, have a propensity to violence but uh, but in general, I think humanity is uh, moving toward uh, uh, wanting peace with each other. Right. And uh, and the other thing is that there's really a strong market out there for keeping those people who are not um, socially adept or not cooperative with others, keeping right. them at, at bay. I mean, more and more we use private security anyway. We don't use government security. Um, and and there's a gigantic market for for private security these days in almost every major American city. There's there's subscription services uh, for for private security to to deal with the problem. Well, right. We're look where government security has gotten us. I mean, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and there's another example she gives that's that's rather funny. She she's she's still she's trying to think through this, and she says. Let's say you lose your, you know, somebody stole your wallet, and, but you don't know who it is. Under a state of anarchy, she says, um, a person would go house to house, break down people's doors, interrupt them in their dinner hour, and club them on the head and demand their wallets and, 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 and keep doing this, 30, 40, 50 houses, until they, uh, till they find the perpetrator. And, um, and there would be nothing to stop this, she says, uh, in absence of government. Now, this is an intriguing scenario because, of course, um, I guess you cannot rule out the possibility that somebody might attempt that, but they would probably attempt that whether or not there's a government. <laughs> you know, right. There's, play, there's plenty of neighborhoods in, in this country where that goes on all the time, and government does nothing to stop it. Well, uh, it sounds <laughs> strikingly familiar to what the government themselves did up in Boston. <laughs> That's true. The only, the, you're right. The only institution that actually has goes house to house and does that is the state because it's the only one that can get away with that. Because <laughs> otherwise people consider that to be out, outrageous and immoral and it would probably be killed. I mean, if I went up and down the street right now and started breaking down people's houses, I mean, I, you know... Um, eventually somebody would call the police, but more likely I would just be shot. You, I was going to say, you'd probably get shot. <laughs> <laughs> you get shot long before the police show up. <laughs> but yeah, no, no. If, if that happens, if the police come banging on your door and you shoot them, then you're branded a criminal. Yeah. That's, that's just because you were defending yourself. So, yeah. yeah. But it, it's, it's, it's interesting this sort of... Um, uh, scenario that she cannot concoct in her head. Now, I would say this is t- typical of of non anarchists. You know, they just have this sort of this this fantasy fear that something is going to go really wrong with the world without government. You know, yeah. Um, and and I and I, I I think this is just wrong actually because, um, and I think you know this if you just sort of trace the steps through your life. Um, day to day, whatever it is you do, if you work in an office or you stay at home or you're, you know, you're, you're a soccer mom or, or you know, you know wh- whatever it is you're doing, you're, you're in, you know, in the program on the internet or whatever. I mean, how often does the state actually touch you um, at all in your life except for basically stealing your money and stopping you from doing things that you want to do that are productive and good things, you know? <laughs> oh, you mean like um, feeding hungry people in a park? That's it. Or collecting rainwater. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's right. This is this is what the state does. So this is it just it's sort of out there to annoy us, you know, like almost every day. I mean, I'm intrigued by um, the, the the news these days about well, California's water shortage because I mean, here you have 
you know, seventy percent of the world surface is covered with, with water. You know, but and, and so, but somehow government's able to manage to to make a massive shortage out of it <laughs> uh, by by uh, um, by not not pricing um, water properly. You know, this is this is the essence of the of the problem, and. Um, it's it's really intriguing. So they they've they've mispriced it. They lead the they allow the ruling class and the, and the elites to get all the water they want, namely uh, large agricultural farming interests, and um, and 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 then the regular consumers have to you know pay through rationing. Right. Um, right. Um, it, it's really it's really just you know a paradigmatic example of what happens under under government control: irrationality followed by massive coercion. Right, right. <laughs> um, you know, the, it's it's fun and interesting to sort of think about like what is the origin of of non anarchist thought. And the more I think about it, I think it all has to trace to to Thomas Hobbes. I think he's really uh, the origin of of modernity's obsession with the idea that we have to have a state. You know, he he had this perception that in absence of the state, life would be uh, brutish and short and violent, and we'd all just um, be fighting with each other all the time. And I, I think that's just em- empirically uh, wrong. I, you know, it's not impossible that that's true, and there are places in the world where where there's there's nonstop war and conflict. But the but but creating the state does not actually improve that. It's very likely, uh, in fact, it's almost guaranteed to actually worsen it. Well, well isn't most war and conflict the result of some kind of uh, hierarchical control in the first place. Yeah, that's 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 always true in all lust for power. Place. Yeah, I mean, all civil wars in the, in the world are a result of people trying to get hold of of uh, the levers of power. You know, that's that's what drove it. It's always been the case. Um, it's, yeah, it's it's not it's not the private sector that leads to to war. It's it's governments. Uh, so if you don't like war, you should definitely not like government. I mean, it's always fomenting war um, all the time. Kind of surprises anarchy, me that there aren't more anarchists out there with with the thing. You know, some of the uh, news stories you've uh, that we've heard over the last few years. I I think that there are ever more anarchists out there. They just maybe don't identify it as that. Uh, but uh, I, you know, anarchism is more popular now than probably it's ever been in the rest of history. Yeah, yeah. Well, Jeff, we're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, maybe we can talk about how uh, people can apply this concept of anarchy into their daily life. Okay. All right. Well, we'll be right back, folks. You're listening to Liberty Unfiltered on K ninety eight Talk. We'll be right back. Ah, good day to you. As a distinguished gentleman, I need a serious source of news. One that doesn't waste my time when I'm enjoying my tea and crumpets. White powdered! White powdered! <laughs> One that catches the most important stories of the day. The poop plane. Was it jet poop? <laughs> Real serious nonsense. Mondays, 9 p.m. Eastern Time, now on K98 Talk. Gonna just like move in another direction towards the classy. We'll be classy and not say dildo. They're completely different from shows that aren't. Hey everybody, this is Jason, host of According to Me. I'd like to invite you to check out my show. It's a two-hour show that lasts 60 minutes in... Uh, listen, I hate to interrupt, but uh, one thing I can do is read off a script. Just say, uh, let me be clear a lot. It works. President Obama, I, I, I can handle this. It's a radio promo. I, I'm not green. I've done this before. Did someone say green? Now, Al Gore is here. Listen, I'm just trying to record a radio promo. Do you mind? Now, uh, do you say good things about me on the show? <laughs> no, not at all. But if it makes you feel any better, I rip on Republicans just as much. The AM radio frequencies give off very high levels of radiation. Look, my show is on the internet, which you invented. I mean, can, I, can I just do my promo? I got a pen. I can veto that, you know. I know you got a pen. It's not a law. It's a radio promo. Listen, listen, just listen to my show. Barack Obama and Al Gore hate it, so you're going to love it. Here's an executive order. Don't listen to a show. He doesn't like me. He's racist. And he doesn't recycle either. That's it. I'm done. It's According to Me, Wednesdays, 10 p.m. Eastern, right here on K98 Talk. This is Misty, owner of Waxit Studio in Edmond, Oklahoma, and I'm here to talk to you about a skincare product called Theramedics. 
Theramedics has a wonderful line of products from anti-aging to hyperpigmentations all the way to acne. In fact, everyone at some point in our life is affected by acne. Acne can cause a great deal of embarrassment and anxiety. And in order to prevent and help other people, I have tapped into this wonderful product called Theramedics. Visit my website at www.prettyskindeep.com. Again, that's www.prettyskindeep.com. K98 Talk is expanding its lineup for 2015. This means we are expanding our advertising base. Whether you're a startup trying to push through to the next level or an established business trying to supplement your advertising budget, web-based advertising is a solid investment. Thanks to Talk's newest partnership with TuneIn Radio and instant access to our sister station, K98 FM, we give you worldwide access at a reasonable cost. Interested parties should email us at sales at k98fm.com. All right, folks, we are back. You're listening to Liberty Unfiltered here on K98 Talk. And uh, my name is Steve Long. I'm the host. I am here with my guest, uh, Jeffrey Tucker. Jeff, again, thanks for coming on the show tonight. It's my pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. So I, I think before we get into this whole idea of giving uh, some practical advice on how to apply anarchy into our lives, um, I was wondering if you could um, kind of introduce the idea of, I think it's a term that you phrased, functioning freedom. Yeah, I mean, the, the thing is that I, I think the very first, well, the first step is to realize that freedom is not just some, uh, you know, a vague abstraction that we have to hope for at some point in the future. We can be free on our own lives today by doing certain perfect things. Yeah, you know um, what? That reminds me of a quote from uh, that article I had mentioned of yours earlier, uh, uh, Making the World a Freer Place. There was a quote that was, uh, and I, I apologize if I'm paraphrasing, uh, liberty isn't something to believe, it's something to do. Yeah, I th- it's... But look, that took me a very long time to realize this. I got interested in this topic of liberty and libertarianism almost as a kind of an abstraction, like the the way I wanted the world to function, Mm -hmm. um, which I believed in order to achieve that, you had to get certain changes from the the government. You had to have a a, a kind of a universal conversion to uh, libertarianism. Then you had to get a sort of top-down political reform that recognized property rights or whatever. Um, It took me a very long time to come come to uh, the realization that freedom is a practical reality that we are going to have to learn to live in our own lives and that political to to wait for freedom uh, for uh, for the state to change is a profound mistake and it's never happened that way in all of history um, the freedom comes about because people start living it and then eventually the political system comes to respond a great example of that is marijuana actually mm-hmm. um, you know 40 years ago um, uh, Richard Nixon declared war on pot and it said that he would uh, extinguish it and just eradicate <laughs> it from from our shores you know how's um, that working the, for him <laughs> yeah and, and the reason why it's 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 becoming legal in ever more places and it and is in de facto legal and and you know probably half the big cities in the in the country if not more is because people didn't comply. You know, they just went on with their lives. They wouldn't be kept in cages. They um, pursued their own preferences. And eventually, uh, the political systems uh, defer to what's going on anyway. And, and that's, that's pretty much the history of freedom in the 20th century. I mean, you look at something like um, the repeal of prohibition. It, it wasn't repealed because uh, academics made powerful arguments and persuaded politicians. Uh, <laughs> It's because people just did it anyway. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's because people just did it, you know? And, um, and eventually politicians have to defer to what's going on in, in the culture. So, you know, it's just, a, it's just a question of whether or not, 
you know, you're going to wait for the political system to change or whether you're going to, you know, act in your own life. And I mean, ultimately, in the end, you know, you have a responsibility as a human being to act as if you're free. Um, uh, and you have a very, you know, in the scheme of things, our lives are very short and you have to make right. it the best of them that you possibly can. And it's just not um, a viable strategy to just, you know, sit and pray and wait and vote and you know, that sort of thing. I, I think it's extremely important to, to uh, step up and, and, and embrace your responsibilities as a human being and, and live as if you're free. I'm not suggesting that people um, take inordinate risks, but, you know, life is a little bit risky. And a life of utter compliance is, is boring and will lead to personal failure. Most of the great successes in our time have come about from people going outside the central plan, uh, doing what they're not supposed to do. And eventually the political authorities, um, once they're overwhelmed with the reality, you know, um, have to defer. This is how revolutions happen. It's not, not, because, not because people are obediently complying with the range of choices that the establishment gives us. It's because they break up the range of choices and do other things. Um, and I think there's many, many ways that, that people can do this in their own lives. So, let me ask you this. Do you think um, anarchy, the, the concept of anarchy is is like a, a, a utopian idea? I don't. I mean, I, I, well, I should say I do believe in utopia in the sense that I think um, we should long for the best possible life that we that we can. But at the same time, I don't see that the introduction of a, of a purely anarchist system would lead to some wild, up, implausible upheaval. I think uh, all that would really happen under state of anarchy is that we'd be richer and uh, we'd be freer and we'd have more options and choices open to us in life. Um, that's the only real big change I can imagine seeing. I think corporations would probably be smaller and more competitive. We'd have more products available. Um, we just generally have uh, better lives and we'd all be richer and, and people wouldn't say there's a massive amount of human suffering in the world that's caused by the state. All that would just completely disappear. That doesn't mean the world would be a perfect place. Um, but, um, but I think it would be vastly better and, we, uh, and we'd, we'd experience vast amounts of economic growth, a plunge in unemployment and longer lives, healthier lives. I, I think all this stuff is, is available to us. And the only reason that's kept at bay is because of public policies. I mean, that's the essence of public policy today is to cut off options and, and to, to make, to make the, the present and the future not as bright as it otherwise would be. And so the key... For people really isn't necessarily to fight against the state, but more uh, maybe work around the state. Yeah, I, I like to think of, of government as a, as a giant sort of mountain that stands in the way, that's just interfering uh, with our, the progress of history and, and the progress of our lives. And you can sit and curse it, you know, and tell it to go away and scream at it and yell at it <laughs> and, and, and lobby hard and make like rational arguments and everything. Or you can just get smart. You know, you can build a, you can dig underneath, you can go around or you can build a, build a helicopter, fly over it, you know, and, and that's, I think, the situation we're in today. And, and most of the progress and freedom is, uh, in our times are, is actually occurring in exactly this way. You know, I think about things like, um, task rabbit undermining uh, occupational licensure laws or uh, Airbnb destroying zoning laws or uh, Lyft and Uber making a mess of municipal taxi laws or things like cryptocurrency destroying the monopoly of, of, of nationalized money or l the lending club uh, challenging um, the cartelized banking system. There's so many revolutionary things going on all around us. Crowdfunding, displacing old-style uh, capital markets and uh, cop block uh, uh, technologies that are, that are actually making it possible for us to not just beat the cops but live safer lives. The, these, and there's, there's like 
You know, I, I have a monograph coming out from Fee called 99 Ways to Leave from the Foundation for Economic Education. For 99, 99 Ways to Leave Leviathan. But in fact, I think there's a lot more than 99 ways. Yeah. You know, there's, there's, uh, there's, there's thousands and tens of thousands and even millions of ways. And they all occur in these very small, discrete steps. That's the way the Leviathan was built over the course of, I would say, 100 years, is through these little discrete steps. And the way to get around it and, and beat it back is through this, this very similar sort of discrete steps. Yeah. Just one step at a time um, uh, in your own life uh, to be aware that there's a, a very subtle central plan that's sort of goading you to act this way and not act that way. And to become conscious of the plan that's around you and try to be creative uh, and, and crowdsource your knowledge. And that's one of the reasons I, I founded Liberty.me was to, to provide a sort of a platform for crowdsourcing uh, ideas on living a freer life. And uh, we, we all do have to come together and, and share tips. You know, maybe that involves immigrating. Uh, you know, maybe that involves you know, complex tax strategies to, uh, you know, leave the U.S. citizenship, or maybe it involves uh, getting involved in the Free State Project in New Hampshire, or maybe it's just something as simple as hacking your shower head right there at home. You know, once you become aware that um, that you're, you're being ruled by uh, people who are no better than you and actually have the desire to harm you, uh, it changes your life. You know, you, yeah. you begin to sort of long for freedom and then you have to make it real. Not, not, just, not just through wishing and hoping and lobbying and, and watching presidential debates and cheering, but taking real steps, you know, in your own life to make yourself freer. I, I think this is the way we're going to beat back the enemy. So what would you say, like, for, uh, let's say, a newbie, so, somebody listening that, that is kind of new to this idea of anarchy and and living free what would you say are the three uh and i'm just throwing three out as a as a arbitrary number uh the three easiest ways to kind of get around that mountain how three easy ways to live free yeah okay so i let me just pick uh three broad areas one would be education uh, we have so many alternatives now to government schooling. I mean, if you have children, you should really yes. do that to avoid government schools. And homeschooling is a great option. Uh, unschooling, just keeping them out of the public schools, at least in their early years, is so crucial. Crucial. And um, don't and don't don't bite this. Uh, don't go for this idea that somehow everybody has to go for college. I mean. Co college education is one of the great robberies of our time. It's, it's an incredible scandal that people prolong um, their adulthood by going to college and spending $100,000, $200,000 for absolutely no reason. If they got out into the commercial marketplace you know, uh, much earlier in life, they would already be way ahead of where they, where they end up after college. And I, I think people are increasingly discovering this. There's so many educational alternatives to that which the government created. So that's that's one major area. Um, another area is uh, in personal finance. You know, you have to remember that the reason interest rates are set to zero uh, nowadays, and the reason the credit, credit is flowing so freely, and, and the and the Fed prints up so much money, is that uh, essentially the ruling class and its state interests uh, desperately want you to be in debt. They want all your present income going to serving debt payments. But you'll never get ahead under these conditions, like ever. It's way in your interest to reduce your consumption level, to live much more simply, and stay out of debt. And that's going to keep you ahead of the curve, to, uh, to buy into the sort of the debt-based money system and um, uh, have all your present income going towards paying interests to... Um, to uh, the financial crowd so know, would, and the state is a, is a gigantic error. So would Bitcoin kind of fall under this? Yeah, that's a great way to become your own banker. I, I, and it's not just Bitcoin, but all the, I, I'm really just nuts for all the altcoins, whether it's Darkcoin or Dogecoin or Litecoin or anything. I, I think these are amazing, wonderful alternatives to government currency. Uh, yeah, I, I use. I, I'm actually using Bitcoin as kind of a blanket term. That's not really what I mean. I'm, that that seems to be the most popular. <laughs> yeah, 
Yeah, no, I understand. Uh, and it may end, end up being, um, um, you know, the, the, the dominant uh, cryptocurrency yeah. uh, in the long run. I, I think there's every reason to believe it will be. But uh, the good thing is that there's currency competition. Yeah. So uh, oh, you've, got, you've got things like dark coin. And, and, you know, we talk about this stuff as if it's normal. I mean, if five years ago we had we talked about <coughs> the fact that cryptocurrencies are now, you know, there's, there's something like uh, five cryptocurrencies or six cryptocurrencies that have broken that barrier of, of reaching dollar parity in terms of their exchange rates and gone beyond it. And that are heavily capitalized, and some of some are more. I mean, there, there's something like there's something like uh, 150 currencies in the world, actually. Um, oh. And uh, Bitcoin, uh, you know, ranks in the top like five or six in terms of usefulness and liquidity overall. That's an extraordinary record in such a short, uh, tiny amount of time. I would encourage people to kind of look into these cryptocurrencies. Um, not so much as an investment scheme, but as a as a as a as a way of participating in an emergent world of of private enterprise currency. Uh, the third thing, if I if I can uh, mention this, is um, we're dealing now, as we saw in California, but it's it's true all over the country. We're dealing with you know really. I, a catastrophic situation with government basically trying to destroy indoor plumbing. I mean, it seems incredible. This is one of the great achievements of capitalism uh, in the 20th century is to bring indoor plumbing to everybody and, and hot showers and, and good sanitation. And ever since um, really it began something like, I have to think about the, what the dates were, but um, I think it was like 1995. There was like a Clean Water Act or something like that that regulated our toilets so that they don't flush well, um, started putting plugs in our, in our shower heads so they don't work well, regulating water heaters, destroying our dishwashing machines, you know, wrecking our, our, our uh, clothes washing machines. And um, at the same time, and ironically, um, ruining detergents, which had been pretty much perfected as cleaning agents by the 16th century. All these terrible things happened at once, and the result has just been just an unbelievable catastrophe for, for sort of household cleaning and the cleanliness in general. There are many ways, you can't, you can't get around them perfectly, but there are many hacks you can, you can undertake. You can, uh, you know, turn up your water pressure in your house. Usually most people who own homes, you know, can find ways to do that. Um, hacking your shower heads, um, being careful to, uh, 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 when you, when you buy dishwashers, you, know, you can buy older model dishwashers and, and, and uh, clothes washing machines and always and use the hottest settings, especially if you've already hacked your, your, um, uh, your hot water heaters. And take, take the uh, plugs out of your faucets to make them run better. There's, there's many ways in which you can actually, uh, you can't go all the way, but you can do your best and make your house just run a lot better and a lot cleaner just through these little acts of... Um, so, you know, sort of t micro rebellion, I guess you would say. <laughs> I, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of, of these sorts of things because they reveal to people the government does not have your best interest at heart. No, no, they don't. Uh, much to everyone, uh, much to a lot of other people's. Uh, uh, no, I mean, it, you know, I mean, Obamacare is a great example of this. I mean, a lot of people right. on the left were really looking forward to this. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, um, thinking that it was going to bring health care to the masses. I mean, it's just so stupid because um, the exact opposite of resulted. The only people who benefited from Obamacare are the large-scale um, insurance companies and medical, the medical establishment and the government. The regular people end up paying <clears throat> a lot more for their health care than they otherwise would have. But the great thing as a result of, of Obamacare is it's given rise to all these private alternatives. Yeah. I mean, concierge health care is now super active. And um, there are lots of um, sort of church-based medical insurers that uh, will insure you at a fraction of the cost, uh, cost of uh, uh, Blue Cross. 
And many doctors are now just refusing to accept Medicaid and, and Medicare and even, even health insurance, you know, because they want to get away from this, this, this stupid system the government's there, created. There are a lot of hospitals doing that now. But it's, yeah. So it's almost like by trying to exert more control, uh, the government has done the exact opposite and is losing control. No, I, th- I think this is, the, you know, I think what we're seeing happen here in this country is very much like what happened in Russia in the, <coughs> pardon, in the 1980s. Uh, uh, the controls just pushed too far. And, you know, people don't understand this, but the reason Gorbachev ended up inadvertently unraveling the Soviet Union was because he started pressing the prohibition of vodka so far that he was arresting masses of people, thousands, tens of thousands of people for, for uh, trafficking in underground vodka. And uh, really, and and the prohibition just got so extreme that people that that's what finally sort of tipped it. Uh, the public anger was just too much, and the state just had finally just discredited itself uh, completely, and the thing just unraveled virtually overnight. Um, I think we're seeing a similar uh, process starting to take place in this country. I don't think it's going to happen the same way. Um, my guess is that uh, uh, democratically elected government is going to take a lot longer to get rid of than something like an outright tyranny, tyranny like Soviet Union. But uh, I do believe that we can create a sort of separate layers of freedom that sit on top of uh, the prevailing status quo. And I think that that's what we're seeing right now. We shouldn't forget that the largest single economy in the world today doesn't belong to any nation. It's the black market. Well, that's not surprising. Yeah, and it's so you know, and all not just. Um, and I don't mean by that just drugs. I mean uh, pirated products, gray markets, uh, 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 workers that are that are not complying with the existing uh, government regulations. I mean, the, 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 the people are not inclined over the long term to go along with what government wants, and. Um, uh, you know, we're just people are just not constructed that way. We're not constructed to be to be slaves and and compliant. Uh, we tend to just do what's in our interest, and our interests directly collide with the interests of the state. You know, across the board, uh, whether it's uh, w- with with taxes or regulations or foreign policy or welfare policies or health insurance, education, you name it, across the board, our personal and private interests directly contradict everything that the state wants us to do and the, and the sooner we realize that uh, the better we're uh, the sooner we're going to be on the path towards revolution I totally agree well Jeff we are uh, coming close to the end I wanted to uh, take the last few minutes to um, talk about um, your writings uh, books like uh, A Beautiful Anarchy um, and the one that I am currently reading, uh, uh, Living in a Jetsons World. If oh, sure. wonderful. I love that book. You know, <laughs> the middle section is one of my favorite things I've ever written. It's, it's sort of least famous in a way. <laughs> the whole middle section deals with this topic of intellectual property. And I, I really went out of my way to help readers think through it by sort of thinking through it myself a little bit at a time. Because the middle section I wrote in, in a period in which I was pretty convinced that intellectual property was was not the same thing as real property and, in fact, contradicted property rights. But it took me a kind of a while to fully internalize that perspective. Um, and so I was reading a book by Bolton Levine called Against Intellectual Property. And I basically, uh, in, Against Intellectual Monopoly is the name of the book. Mm-hmm. And I was live blogging while I was reading. So I was recording my reactions, uh, chapter <laughs> by chapter. And what resulted was a kind of a really nice lengthy essay on the topic of intellectual property. And I, I really encourage everybody to go through that <clears throat> and read it in detail because I think uh, it's, it provides a real serious intellectual challenge um, and, an, and an exciting one. So um, I like that book for that reason. Yeah, um, I'm enjoying it so far. It's a Jetsons World. Where can people pick that up? Um, I think you could probably just Google it and then just go Jetsons World EPUB and it'll probably come back come up immediately. Um, also, Liberty.me distributes a, a canonical version of it. I was going to say, uh, if you are a member of Liberty.me, you can download it for free. 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, anybody can join for free for 30 days, and after that, it's like five bucks a month or something. Yeah. Um, but it's a wonderful community, and you get not just my book, but uh, 200 other book downloads that are just, it's, just, oh, yeah. it's great. It's the best literature collection it's, I've ever seen. I got to say, for nothing else, I mean, Liberty Dot Me, number one, is a, is a great social media alternative uh, to things like Facebook uh, and, and, uh, and Twitter, although I do spend quite a bit of time on the latter. Um, I love Twitter. I, I think Twitter is a lot of fun. It's, it, it takes a while to learn, but it's, it's yeah. very valuable. But, but not even so much for the, for the social media aspect of Liberty.me, but for the uh, uh, educational aspect, because there's so much on there to read through uh, not just the books that you can download, but all of the books blog posts and essays that are on there it's just i mean that's how i found uh that article that i have been referring to the making a world a freer place uh, mm-hmm. that's where i found that and there's just so much on there by so many different people it's uh, wonderful and you know i always tell people if they if you join liberty.me if even if you don't use it every day but some people do but even if you only use it every once in a while it's there for you yeah. Um, if you ever if you ever need it, if you get in trouble uh, with the law, there's there's a, if you've got a, a friendship network that will is going to help you. Yeah. Um, and we're all uh, in the situation these days where you know the state's just right in the corner, ready to grab us by the neck and uh, destroy our lives. So um, Liberty at Me is a kind of a internal um, uh, sort of just community protection society in many ways. Definitely, definitely. Yeah, it's there for you anytime you need it, and it's a wonderful website. Absolutely, it is. It's great. I like it. Well, uh, that's that's it for us. I, I want to thank you for coming on again, Jeff. It was great having you again. My pleasure. Always, a, always a pleasure to have you on the show. Um, where can they find you on Twitter? Uh, on Twitter, I think my handle is Jeffrey A. Tucker on Twitter. Okay. Um, you're more than welcome to go check it out. Um, I think I've, I think I've got close to fifteen thousand followers. So I'm very pleased by that. Very nice. Um, and I would be very happy for anybody to come in and follow me. Yes, Jeffrey A. Tucker. All right. Um, I'm at fourteen seven. Thrilled by that. Really happy, and I'll try to keep you delighted and keep feeding you the good stuff. Great, great. Always a pleasure. Thanks. Okay. Thank you so much. All right. Well, folks, that is all for the show tonight. Uh, be back here again next week, uh, same time, Monday, 7 p.m. Central, 8 p.m. Eastern. Um, topic to be determined. Uh, but stick around on K98 Talk because uh, real serious nonsense is coming up next. Um poll will be, uh, well, the show will be kind of taken over by uh, Bill and Leslie as uh, Angie takes a break, Uh, but I believe poll will still be with them, Uh, but uh, it's a great show, so stick around for it and uh, check it out in the chat room, Um, but that's all for us tonight, and uh, thanks for tuning in tonight. Bye, folks.